expanding the zone. We're up to show 18 now. This has been a lot of fun over the last couple months. Uh, my brother Matt here with me uh, as always. And and Matt, uh, I think we have a fun topic this evening. Uh, I know we're continuing to grow our YouTube channel uh, here on uh, S. SVC Sport Zone Shane, that's for svcsportzone.com. Um, we're excited here. High school sports gradually getting started. Had some golf scores to report on the website. Uh, for those of you maybe new to the show, svcsportzone.com, uh, turning 13 years old this year. Uh, podcast show SVC Sports Talk will be turning 10. Uh, good Lord willing, we'll be hitting 300 shows uh, early in, in uh, our 10th season here. So just real excited about that. And, and obviously excited about this too, Matt, what we're doing, our expanding the zone. Uh, for people that have been with us here, uh, know that we're just trying to do just that. We're trying to uh, expand our information, uh, make some leadership out of it, um, and, and some different things. So just just your thoughts here over the first couple months of expanding the zone and, 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 and the purpose it's been able to accomplish beyond uh, our svcsportzone.com goal that we started there 13 years ago. Well, I think it's been fun to this point, Shane, just doing this show, expanding the zone. I think – you know, through these, whatever we're at now, 17, 18 episodes, whatever it is, um, we, you know, when we started this, we, we wanted to have some fun with it, honestly, uh, just the same type of conversations you and I have, if we're riding somewhere in the car, or we're just talking sports, talking leadership, um, hopefully, along with having a little bit of fun with it, we, we've been able to hit on some topics and maybe help if nothing else, uh, stir some thought and some debate. Cause I think that's healthy sometimes let's face it in leadership. Um, I think it's healthy sometimes for to, to stir up thought and to stir up discussion. You know, if, if some of the things we've talked about on this show, if it's created a little talk around the water cooler or whatever, um, to me, that's, that's healthy in leadership, just discussing things, debating things. We don't always have to agree with each other. Right. And, and, I think sometimes it's just it's just it's fun and it's and it's and it's a good learning experience just to see things from different angles and think about things from different angles. So that's really what we've tried to do. You know, it's very different, obviously, than the podcast you're used to doing with with the SVC Sports Talk, where you're where you're covering a league and you guys have had obviously ridiculous success with that show, having that many episodes. Um, but so I, I think this is a little bit of a different take on sports and just something a little more off the cuff. And uh, so far it's been enjoyable. It seems like the feedback's decent on it. And, and I think people have tuned in and liked it well enough. So we'll, we'll, we'll continue to do it for a while. Well, Matt, tonight show 18 is pet peeves. And, and with pet peeves, it, it, it's, it's a really fun show because we, we are going to have some um, – we're going to get a chance to joke around a little bit together. We're going to pick out some things that are probably funny, um, but but there's really a serious leadership side of it too. And I think sports fans and just leader uh, people of leadership will really enjoy. And as you, you I thought you said it best, is really going to uh, uh, get some people thinking uh, about certain things. But then it's going to tie back to leadership in a, in a very unique way. So I think this is going to be one of our more unique shows. Obviously, Matt, we know pet peeves. It's it's something you know I find annoying that in nor normal circumstance, maybe you or maybe a, a, another you know, group of people or whatever, maybe necessarily wouldn't. And as I said just a second ago, it's going to be fun. Uh, it, it's, it's probably going to have some times where we have some laughs and so forth. But in all seriousness, why do you think this topic becomes such a critical matter or a serious matter for leaders to be aware of uh, throughout the workplace or, or, you know, be it their business, be it their school, be it their teams, uh, whatever it is they're trying to lead? Well, I think some of the, the more serious things we'll talk about, um, the things that have to do with leadership, I think it's it's always important as a leader to sort of know what or how – got to know what makes people tick, right, yeah. when, oh, when yeah. you're leading yeah. people. And part of knowing what makes them tick know, is knowing what bothers them too and what – you know, what's frustrating and those types of things. I think if you're going to be a successful principal, coach, athletic director, whatever, you, you know, you have to know, okay, if, if I do these things, there's a certain uh, faction of the people that it, this, this bothers or it frustrates. And uh, I just think that's part of the learning curve and, and, and understanding that. So, you know, so some of these things we'll talk about tonight, they, like you say, I think you said it, I think you said it very well these pet peeves that they don't bother everybody. Uh, they bother some people, 
And so I think as a leader, you have to adjust your approach to do the best you can. You're never going to make everybody happy. I mean, obviously, but to the best you can to lessen the, the frustration amongst uh, the, the people that, uh, that you're leading. Well, I, I, the, the, the term that I put down in my notes here as, as you were speaking is bothers them. I, I think that that's the phrasing that really jumps out at me because I think what happens in leadership is if I'm trying to teach a skill to my players, I may have three or four different players in a drill, and I may have to phrase it. I may have to talk at a different level, three or four different levels. You know, a lot of times if a principal's trying to get a point across to a staff member, uh, and then they go next door to another staff member, they may not be able, he or she may not be able to say it in the same tone, the same phrasing. Um, do, you, do you feel that kind of goes back to the personal relationship? Because, because it's, it's some of the first ones I'm going to throw at you here have to do with, if, if I were to categorize them, probably have to do with people skills, have to do with awareness, how we treat people. Um, don't you think there's a connection there right off the bat when we're going to connect this to leadership in terms of what bothers them is a great way of putting it because you, you've got to be able to relate to a lot of different personalities if you're going to be successful as a leader. Yeah, yeah there's no question you have to be able to uh, – you have to be able to reach all different types of personalities for sure. Uh, you're never – you know, it's, it's, it's easy to, to lead people who think like you do and, and who react exactly the way you want them to. Right. And it's it's it, that's not the challenge. The challenge is being able to lead people who may think differently than you and uh, who who may at times even question you. And you, you've got to be willing to, to, I think, as a leader to accept that as well sometimes. So, um, yeah, there's no doubt that the, the people skills come in into play here big time. Well, I'll, I'll just start you know, with, with that kind of being where we've, we've kicked the show off here. I'll just start because I've got a long list of these here tonight. I'll just kind of start with people skills. You know, a lot of times some of, the, some of my pet peeves just come with, you know, the ability to hold a door, the ability to when you do hold the door for someone. Thank you. Acknowledge it. You're welcome. You know what I mean? How are you today? Do, do you see where I'm coming from there? Is, is that just – is that just that I'm a pretty talkative person? I'm a pretty social person. Is that something that, you know, I happen to look too far into, or do you think there's something to that when it comes to leadership? Because people skills, you can really rub me the wrong way in a hurry if I know you're not. Well, I think sometimes first impressions, right? I mean, that that's important when it comes to leadership because you may only get one chance to 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 talk to somebody and to leave uh, an impression and i can promise you over the years uh, i've certainly left the wrong impression i know on people at times you know uh i think sometimes in coaching and the heat of the moment and things like that if, if somebody only sees you in that setting you can certainly you can certainly leave the wrong impression but but i think that so the things you're talking about, you know, some of those things I think are common courtesies and just manners. But but I think too, sometimes you can accidentally offend somebody when you, you're not even meaning to. You know, maybe somebody waves at you and you don't see them, and and all of a sudden, man, what they didn't wave back. I mean, you know, right. but but yeah, there's you have to understand that I think that that that. It's just like we always tell with last week's show, right? When we talked about this, there's somebody's always watching, and mm -hmm. you know how you're sort of how you're behaving, how you're how you're operating matters. Well, and a lot of it's just that awareness too. You know, you'll you'll get these people, you know, in public sometimes. Uh, you know, I was reading some different pet peeves of people before the show, and it was talking about people who stand in front of the door, people who block up to get the grocery out, and they don't even know they're doing it a lot of times, right? It's it's right. it's an awareness thing, and and I got to thinking that a lot of this, you know, how big I am on perspective when it comes to this. Don't you think sometimes, you know you might be on your plan period as, as a teacher and you may have a, a to-do list of like five, six, seven things. And the teacher from across the hall comes in, just talking, doing whatever. There has to be a, an awareness of still professionalism and how you treat people. I guess it still goes back, goes back to that. You know, Matt, we'll just kind of go back and forth. What there on your list, do you have one that you want to kind of take a turn and throw at me? I, it's funny. You just made a comment there about, you know, when people come into your room or people coming over I've always felt like this is this is one. This is kind of a, a serious one, I think, in leadership is just not respecting other people's time 
or what or respecting what other people are doing at a time. Like I'll give you some examples. This happens to me a lot uh, over the years at school. I'll be talking to the principal. I'm st maybe I'm standing in the hallway. We're having a conversation. There's even times where worse yet, I'd be I'll be in his office and we'll be having a conversation. And somebody will just come in. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but well, they're not real sorry to interrupt because they're interrupting, <laughs> you know. Um, and then they'll just go right into what they're wanting to say. And I think to myself, you don't know how many times I've stood outside that door for <laughs> six or seven minutes, which seems like an eternity, right? But I'm going to let him finish the conversation with somebody else. But people don't afford you that same courtesy. They just come up. Uh, it's almost like, uh, you know, I think you were going to talk about this in a few minutes. I don't want to steal your thunder, but like the no offense, right? You know, it's like, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but then they interrupt. Yeah. But no offense, but I'm going to say something offensive. Yeah, no offense, but I'm getting ready to insult you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. it's, it, does that make it better? <laughs> you know no. what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> no. No uh, offense, but, but you're an idiot. Like, you just called the person yeah. an idiot. You know what I'm well, saying? It's, it's like, yeah, it's like we used to have a running joke amongst my friends. Like, if you say something mean to me and you can follow it up with no offense, like before the statute of limitations runs out, which is like five seconds, <laughs> then I can't even get mad about it, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> so no, that that's definitely one. I think in all, in all seriousness, though, the respecting time, respecting people's time. You know, I think you send a bad message when you basically say, hey, what I have right now is way more important than what you guys are talking about. That's a bad message to send, I think, when, when, when you're in a, either a leadership position or if you're, you're in a position where um, maybe, you're, maybe, you're not, maybe you're just in a position of not in the leadership, you still want to be careful with that, I think. Do you think real quick, Matt, because you know, each time you say something, it just kind of triggers something on the list. Do you think that has something to do with being late? You know, obviously in coaching, obviously in teaching, our, our days and our practice plans and our, and our, you know, our agendas, and, and I'm sure in the workplace, deadlines, being on time. How much, how much of a respect factor is that? How annoying does that become to you as a coach, to you as an AD, just in terms of you trying to lead any type of group where, you know, look, life happens. We're all, we've all been late before, but I'm saying on a consistent basis of, of you know, a lot, a lot of people even say to, to, to be early is to be on time. You right. Know, you kind of fall on, on, that, on that line. Uh, where, where do you stand on people being late when it comes to you getting ready to start a practice or a meeting? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm pretty uh, when it comes to like practice and things like that. I'm pretty adamant that we're going to start right on time. I, to me, that's that's like an attention to detail thing. So if we start practice at four o'clock, there's been times where something would happen that I would have to start practice at four o five, four o four if I get stuck at a meeting or something. And when those things happen, I feel terrible because I'm to me I'm sending a terrible message to my team because four o'clock doesn't mean four o three. It means four o'clock. And if we're not going to pay attention, and it probably to details, means let's be ready to go at three fifty-five. Well, you know yeah, I mean? obviously. Yeah. I mean, we tell our guys, you know, we get out of school really late for, compared to most, and we get out at three thirty. And you know, we tell our guys, listen, we're going to give you fifteen twenty minutes to get taped, to go out to your car, do what you got to do, talk to your girlfriend, get dressed, all that. Because when you know when we're going to start, we're going to start. So we try right. to give them plenty of time there between school and practice. But then, obviously, we want to be. You know, it's again, it's that attention to detail. It's it's little things like returning an email, uh, returning a phone call. You know, I and I've said this before. I used to get really frustrated with with athletic directors for not getting back with me or not being able to reach them. But in all fairness, there's I found out as I got more into this business, there's athletic directors out there to teach five classes a day too. It's like mm. when are mm. when are these poor people supposed to get their work done? You know, I feel for those guys because how how can you teach a, a full load and and do that job? I I just don't know how you can. Here's one Shane that really kind of hit home with me here just the last couple of days, and I've always felt like this is an issue in in in, in leadership and 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 in our line of work in schools or whatever. My pet peeve, I guess, would be people think that thorough or better means more. Like more mm. is always better. Or if you're going to be right. thorough, it's got to be more. It's like, you know, I, I'll get an email with, with like this COVID thing's been just, just a great example of this, right? Because somebody will send you something, um, hey, uh, look these over. This is going to be uh, some guidelines for return to play or guidelines for how we're going to handle. And I'll open an email. There'll be 12 pages. 
And right. I'm like, you know, what, what, I mean, let's trim the fat a little bit. Right. I mean, if, if you know, when, when we pass out, this happened uh, early on in my athletic director tenure, I said, you know, we, we pass out this handbook every year to our parents and it's like 30 pages long. I mean, what's, what's, <laughs> what's the likelihood of them reading this? And, and I know the answer to that because I do the same thing as a parent. My kids will bring stuff home and I'm like, oh, another form. I mean, we just get formed to death, right, in today's study, right? Another right. form. Um, another thing I got to read. And you, and you end up, it's like cliff notes. You end up just sk skimming it, just scanning through it. You're not really reading it. And I actually took the handbook and started, like I said, trimming the fat a little bit. And next thing I know, it was a, it was a pamphlet. You know, we turned the handbook <laughs> into a pamphlet because in all honesty – the, 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 the meat and potatoes of it, what we really wanted parents to know, mm. we could do that. And then I think probably now 75, 80% of the parents at least really read it because it's just the front and back of, a, of an 8 by 11 paper. But anyway, I think sometimes that's a pet peeve of mine. It's like, and you may, you may want to comment on this. You teach, I know you teach language arts. Uh, are you are you in the camp of you have to tell a kid, hey, I want five pages here, or I want, or are you more like, Hey, I want you to write until it's done. You know, if it takes eight pages, right. fine. If it takes three paragraphs, fine. I mean, what, how do you, I know probably if you don't put something on it. Well, yeah, you know, the, the, the more is better is interesting. You know, uh, basically the state of mind I'm in this evening as we come on the air, you know, you might say that um, <laughs> more of watching the Cincinnati Reds throw out of the bullpen is not better. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's, a, but it's a situation like in language arts, I think it, the, in every walk of life, I think you have to kind of know the rules and play the game, you know. So, so I, I do get I do get kids to understand that, you know. A lot of times in a five paragraph essay, it's introduction, body, conclusion. Now, how do we go about saying what we want to say? Exactly, you know. I mean, let's not get wordy just to get wordy. What what message are you trying to send? I, I've read I've read some paragraphs that are you know. 13 sentences that are awful. I've read some that are four that are excellent. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, so I totally, I totally think that comes into, to, to the writing and to the message. I think a lot of times it's something I constantly try to work on in the podcast. Sometimes you feel like your answer can get a little lengthy when in reality, what message are you trying to, to send? So when you say more is better, you know, you'll, you'll get people that kind of be funny in terms of, you know, money and food and, and fame and all those things. But in all seriousness, and when you get right down to the to the heart of leadership, I think it's 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 more about being real. It's more about being genuine. It's more about communication uh, than it is to put the put the dog and pony show on. This this guy. Yeah, 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 and, yeah, I, and, I, and I don't want to interrupt. I'm, I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna give you an example of this real quick if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, you know, you just said. Uh, Basically, I think what you, what you said and the way I would put it is part of being a, a leader is being clear and concise, mm -hmm. right? Knowing, right. You, like you tell your students, know what you want to say. Don't get wordy for a second being wordy. Know what you want to say. Know what message you want to get across. Mm -hmm. We had a situation this week where, and I'll try to make this quick as I can, but basically a friend reached out to me with a, with a question about high school eligibility. A uh, buddy of mine that lives in another part of Ohio, not, is not in my district or anything, but he just knows I'm an athletic director and says, Hey, you know, I've got an eighth grade son going into ninth grade. I've got an incoming ninth grader basically may or may not be good enough to play varsity football right there on that edge though. And, and like, if, 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 if we start football here, let's say we have a game or we get right up to the games and it's canceled, he's going to lose a year of freshman eligibility. And, you know, I'm considering the, holding him back, you know, having him do a year of online schooling in the eighth grade again. Hopefully by next year, all this COVID stuff is behind us and we get back to normal. And look, I mean, I, you know, I see his point. I thought it was valid. I mean, I think it's a valid question. There's a lot. I of think, I think it's fascinating. It's almost, it's almost another show topic in itself. I'm interested to see where the story is going to go. Yeah. yeah. So, so, and I don't want to take it there, but my point to all this is this uh, tonight's show. I, to do the guy a favor, I said, look, I'll, I'll reach out to the OHSA. I'll ask a question. His question was, when do you become a freshman? Like, mm -hmm. when is it too late to go and do eighth grade again? Do you become a freshman when your first scrimmage happens? Do you become a freshman when you start school? I, I start looking through the bylaws, and I see something where it says 15 days after you start a semester, 
that's when the semester actually counts, which I thought it was five days. And I think, man, I, I don't know if I'm reading this right. So what, what do I do? I, I reach out via email to the OHSA. Tried to be very polite about it. Hey, here's my question. This was posed to me. Um, I get an email back from them that's just almost like, I mean, the first line was, well, I have no idea where you get 15 days from. That was the first line of the email. And, and then it goes on to almost like you're bothering me with this. Why are you even asking me this? Almost frustrated that a parent would even consider this move, you know, because I know the OHSA a few years ago, they wanted to uh, discourage kids from being held back in the eighth grade. So they wouldn't let you play a second year of eighth grade basketball, right? Or eighth right. grade football. Remember that? Right. But Went then the two years of junior high, correct? Right. But Basically, then, that's what they called it. Yeah. But then like out of nowhere said, oh, by the way, you can play up until you're 20 years old. So I, I don't understand. I mean, to, so right. on one end, you discourage it, and one end, you encourage it. But anyways, that's another topic. So I said, just really kind of like acted like I was putting them out. I thought, oh, all right, you know, emailed them back. I was very polite. I said, hey, appreciate your response. I'll pass on the information. I said, to be honest, I the 15 days came from bylaw 4-3-5. Uh, I probably misread it, misunderstood it. It's my fault. Thanks again, you know get another email back well you could have told me that to begin with was the first line of it from the, from the ohsaa so my point to all this is oh. you know i thought wait a minute here i thought here's why the confusion st set in and this is how it pertains to this topic your bylaws are 34 pages long it goes back to your, <laughs> your to your and, handbook analogy yeah, yeah and it's one of the wordiest documents you ever lay your eyes on i mean you talk about it it'll make your eyes bug out trying to read that thing mm -hmm. and 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 then when we call, when we ask a question, we're inconveniencing you, we're bothering you. And I feel like saying, let's be real honest here. There's a lot of people out there right now questioning the leadership of that organization to begin with. And, and you're frustrated with me for just reaching out with a simple question. But my point is, it's that, it's that wordiness. It's that, well, to be thorough, it's got to be this thick document. Look how thick our bylaws are. I don't think it has to be that. I think it needs to be to the point. Well, and, and I think when, when you talk about to the point, I think words do matter. Word choice matters, and the detail of words matter. You know, a lot of times the, the, a pet peeve of mine will come in these catchphrases that we just use for convenience in leadership, and, and I try my best to avoid them because I know when, when I hear them, they kind of run through me like, you know, well, you just got to do what's best for kids. Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. And you know, you'll you'll sit in a meeting and, and you'll and you'll just look at them like you know. I'd almost rather you look at me and just say I'm an idiot because you know what I mean. Like if we're going to really do what's best for kids, we would go do this, 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 and this. You know what I mean? The whole right. reason we're in here is we're figuring out let's do what's best for kids within the resources we have. You see what I'm saying? So so like a lot of times, I think it's just a cop out in terms of yeah. well, you got to go do this just because. You know what I mean? In terms of of, so there's a lot of those catchphrases that exist, and I think so to tie it into your point, I think your word choice as a leader and then your ability to sell your point and to be very clear on here's exactly what I want done, here's why, I realize that these things might be a challenge, therefore we may have to try this, this, and this, but in the end we're trying to do this. Is that kind of – if yeah, I follow well, what you're saying, does that fit? Yeah, exactly. And like what's best for kids, you know, that that it's it goes one of mine. And I've said this a million times on the show. I can't stand it when we put perception, when we rank perception way over reality. In other words, we're way mm -hmm. more concerned with what it looks like than what it is. I, yeah. I don't for one second say that perception doesn't matter. It does. OK, I mean, if appearances didn't matter, it'd be OK for you to go teach class in gym shorts and a, and a tank top. OK, appearances matter a little bit. I mean, how you look, how you <laughs> act, they do. But what I'm saying is when perception becomes the number one thing, and I think with the with the do what's best for kids, hey, who can argue with that? Right. I mean, if you say that, uh, I mean, no one can argue with that. It's it's kind of like uh, the the golf excuses when your game's bad in golf. Well, I'm I'm, I'm tinkering with my swing. Yeah. I'm rusty. You know, yeah. I've, just haven't played. I've changed my swing. I, I use I use change. that one all the time. You know, yeah. what I, mean? I go out and I'm I'm four over after you know two. I mean, I, I haven't played in two. Haven't weeks, played. You know I mean? Right, right. You know, um, elbow, cramp, you know, yeah. tendonitis, whatever. Yeah. You know, but yeah. So it, it's it's sometimes it's sort of a cop out or sort of an excuse or. Or, or, or whatever, but but yeah, I definitely see your point. I'll tell you another one, uh, Shane, I, and I, I, I know we're just like kind of going back and forth here. 
the old email, okay, I, I love this one, when, when people email you with something that maybe you screwed up. This has happened to me once or twice because I screw up a lot. But, like, so someone will email you, and, and in the little CC, like, where they're going to send it off to somebody else to take a look at, too, they'll, they'll send it to your super <laughs> I got you. Yeah, I got you. Like, yeah, 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 like, hey, Matt, you know, really, the next time this happens, I'd appreciate it if you do this. And, uh, by the way, I'm sending this to the superintendent, too, so maybe yeah. you can really get some hot water. I mean, it basically, they may as well write that in the email, right? You gotta, it's you almost, gotta love the it's almost an adult version of the two kids out at recess when they run over and say, hey, Jimmy won't share the ball. You know, they, like, <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's just a more modern version. You don't have to say it. Now you can just email it, right? Right, right. Oh. Hey, I, I have one here that, you know, I, I think when it comes to different challenges that people take on, it's, an, it's annoying to me in the school setting. I think this happens in the business setting. And tell me if you've had some experience of this. It's not enough for people to not necessarily support something. It's almost like they have to sabotage it. You know, and you see it in the world today more than ever. You know, if you're not, if you're not in favor of something, it's okay to have an opinion, but you don't have to go out of your way to sabotage it. You know what I'm saying? So, like, if we're running a program at school and you're not really on board with this program we're doing, well, then, again, for the good of the team and the good of the school and the good of the kids and good, you know, kind of be professional and leave your thoughts out of it, you know what I mean, and, right. and voice those at the proper time. Um yeah, I, I hope I'm saying that clear enough there because that's something that really, really bothers me. If I see something that is not as important to me, I try, I try really hard not to do something that's going to be detrimental to it. Uh, does that, does that, you follow right. what I'm saying? There? Right. Well, yeah, because I mean, it's not like it's, it's one of those situations that may not really be affecting you or hurting you. You may not right. really agree with it. Think about our world today. And I had this down as a pet peeve is, and this could be, uh, and this gets off the sports topic and I don't want to go too sway too far here, but people make everything political. You know, mm -hmm. every single thing is political. I mean, we have a virus that has been made political, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, think about how silly that is. It's a medical condition that affects every political party the same you know democrats get it republicans get it we make it political right it's like mm -hmm. i mean what's next like strep throat is that going to be political too i mean right. it's a medical condition so but i think what you're saying is it it pertains to that in a way because it's almost like we we're, we we're trained when we see something to take a side you know, you, you, you understand what I'm saying? that's a good point like, that i, like I didn't we're, really we're think almost about it, yeah. we're almost programmed to take a side like this happened I have to have a, an opinion on this. I have to take a side. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sort of one of the most apolitical people in the world. You know, I, my wife will tell you, I, I don't watch the news that much. I don't really take, because it's just not my thing. I, you know, it's not that I don't care. It's not that I don't vote. I do, but it's, it's just, I'm not, I'm just not one of those guys that gets that wrapped up in that stuff. And but I think I think we do kind of feel like we have to take a side sometimes. And I think what well, you're saying is you don't necessarily have to. Well, right? I think it goes back. We talked about this in, in past shows about staying in your lane in American history. If there's a problem in the math department, is it really my lane to step out in front and start, you know, banging my, my fist on the desk saying we should do this? Well, well no. Who am I? You see what I'm saying? Right. But at the same time, even if I'm not in favor of them, I, I don't need to be doing something that's sabotaging the math department. Same way with you as an AD. If there's a situation at Vinton County High School, then it's obviously your business. It's obvious that you're going to have an opinion on it. But, you know, if, if, if there's issues at other, you know, schools throughout and, and they're asking your opinion or whatever, it's okay to have an opinion. But for you to step out in some leadership role and almost be attacking them or, or trying to set them up for failure, that's when you're crossing a line of professionalism, in, in, in my opinion. And, and I, I just see it, I see it way too much. Now, in terms of passion, another thing I had down, it bothers me. And I know, I know you're making fun of me back in the, the second show of the year well, on cheating. But it, it bothers me when knowledge and intensity, if it is something that you're passionate about and it is something you believe in, I think this is different. It bothers me when people um, look at it as you care too much or, 
you know, why do you care too much or, or, or so much? Um, you know, why, why do you press the limits on that? Do, do, do you have any experiences in, in, in your profession, Matt, or just in your career where you've been really, really passionate about something? I mean, basketball might be the most obvious thing right. where, where people look at you be like, Matt, you, you, you probably care too much about that, you know, and, and it, it, and almost, it's like they paint a picture of, they, they don't understand that you do understand that there's more important things in basketball, but this is something that you put a lot into and you believe in. So that, that, that's something I run into a lot in my line of work of teaching and coaching. Yeah. I mean, I think I didn't put this on my list, but one of my, one of my pet peeves over the years has been people that when they fail, you get the old, I didn't really care. You know, mm. I mean, you get that a lot as a teacher, yeah. right? A kid, a kid gets an F. It's a made excuse out there. I just didn't in case. care, man. I didn't. Yeah, you cared. You didn't want an F. Okay. You know I mean, yeah. but, but you also didn't want to study, and you didn't want to commit to it, so you got an F. And mm. and like I think because that's always bothered me. If I'm involved in something, I typically am 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 giving it, you know, as the best to the best of my ability, a hundred percent. And sometimes that makes you come across as a little psycho. You know, I I think that. We talked about this in one of our other shows. When you're driven, when what's something that you do, you will rub people the wrong way sometimes. That's just the fact of life, you know, because there's going to be a, a portion of people that don't quite understand that. Either either they're not driven, period, or they're not driven within the same thing you're driven in, right? And they have a hard time understanding why you're so passionate about that. Uh, um but yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's like one of those things. Like you said, if you believe in something wholeheartedly, and you're you're 100 all in with it, if somebody somebody else doesn't understand that, they might be. I'll give you an example, like because this was on my list. Actually, it's funny how we didn't talk about this before, but some of them kind of bounce back and forth naturally here. But like analytics, I think I mentioned this in one of the other shows briefly. But in sports today, analytics are a huge thing right in every sport i mean it's becoming it's becoming just a, a huge deal i know like i've made the comment in basketball i personally like analytics i i enjoyed crunching the numbers looking at data i think some of it's very very useful um we've we've actually you know at benton county implemented some of the, these things into our approach but i think sometimes too my pet peeve is when people take analytics to an extreme to where that, that every single move has to be what the book tells you to do. You it's know? a cop-out. Yeah, I, I think coaching still an art, not a science. I, I, I made that comment on the show, and I think some people want to make it a science. It's like, well, like you mentioned the Reds earlier. It's obviously been a frustrating week or so, but the problem is with the Reds, uh, they've, they're all in with analytics right now, okay, and to the point where – they, they've hired people that you wouldn't even, unless you're a big res fan, you wouldn't even know their name because they're studying spin rate of baseballs and they're studying all the stuff because they're all into analytics. That's great. I mean, the more knowledge, the better. But but I think there's times where as a manager, you got to sit in that dugout and say, you know what? I know the book doesn't say this, but my gut tells me I got to pitch this guy in the eighth inning. My gut tells me I got to hit this guy right now. Mm -hmm. I see it in basketball all the time in a high school level. One of the big things in basketball that, that analytics disciples will tell you is how terrible a shot the mid-range shot is. And, and, and most people listening are sports fans. I know so they're going to know the mid-range shots, that shot from about foul line area, 15, 12 to 15 feet, whatever. Well, the reason analytics, in my opinion, show that as a terrible shot is that nobody shoots a normal pull-up jump shot from 15 feet anymore. Every mid-range shot now is a floater. Um, some high arcing bull crap that has no chance of going in off balance. Um, you know, you're settling for that shot rather than earning that shot. It, it's, it, it's a shot that's not for everybody, obviously, but, but um, so sometimes the wrong person takes that shot. And all of a sudden you start looking at the data by itself and you say, well, man, uh, only 20% of mid range shots go in here. It's not, it's not a, you know, well, no, I mean, you're taking terrible shots. Uh, I would argue there's a lot of players I could sit here and give you names right now at the high school level that had no problem hitting mid range shots, especially against us, because I had to sit there and watch it happen all the time. But, but so you understand what I'm saying? Like, I think, oh, I sometimes think people use absolutely. analytics as, and I, I joked before, I said, if, if analytics was the, the be all end all, then just pick your smartest science teacher at your school and let him coach all your sports because he's a lot smarter than us and he could just go off the, off the data. It's still an art. Coaching's still an art. 
Well, it, it, it is. And I, I, I said cop out there because I think sometimes people use it as well. That's what the, you know, the numbers kind of say there and they go with it where you, again, there's no, there's no gut to it. There's no eyeball test of, you know, what, one of the things I had down here is about how I'm as competitive as anyone, but when it comes in evaluation, self-evaluation, um, player evaluation, I try to get my players to understand in self-evaluation. You can't, you can't just live and die on the result. You know, again, yeah. I, I know I'm contradicting myself here because I'm extremely competitive. I know we're in a results-driven business. Let's face it, right. we want to win. Right. But at the same time, I have to be careful as a coach because there's times, there's times we we win. We might have turned it over 23 times and shot. 48% from the free throw line and somehow we win the game or in, right. in baseball, we might've walked six guys tonight, made three errors, missed two signs and didn't get a bunt down in the fourth inning. And somehow we win eight to seven. Or, right. Now there's other times though, that on it, you lose four to three and you go back and you're like, we threw strikes, made routine plays. We didn't miss a sign on right. night. I felt like attitude in the dugout was good. We tried. And at the end of the night, we just got beat. You know what I'm saying? So sure. sometimes you know, no matter what the numbers tell you, you, you have to, you have to look at results. You're competitive and you know, but, but I, but I, but I, I love what you said there in terms of some people set themselves up for failure. We've all coached that athlete that, you know, I can remember about 15 years ago, I obviously won't use names, about 15 years ago, I can remember watching a, a pair of golfers in our area and I would go out and I'd watch these two young men play and you know, player A would hit eight of the top 10 shots I'd see all night. And player B would beat him by five shots. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because it was one of those where, hey, I'm so talented. I'm going to try this, this, and this to where if I make a seven, it's, well, I was trying this shot. You know what I'm sure. saying? Sure. It's, it's that's, yeah, that's the excuses we talked about earlier. And, and, yeah. and it is. And, and, and I think we've all been there. I think in our maturity and competition, we've all been there at some point. We, we, all, we all kind of let ourselves go there. So, and as you get older and older and older, you, you see some of those things and, and you go. Well, Matt, I want to. Well, I wanna, and, 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 I, and let, me, let me hit you Go ahead and finish too. that because I'm going I'm to flip the page on you completely. Well, and I know as we get into these, we're going to be all over the place because I know we got some fun ones, you know. To, yeah. but, but like along those lines of we're talking about analytics, right? It's a lot easier to say, well, this says to do this. I'm going to do this. Or, yeah. And I think the same thing comes in when we try to sometimes emulate. I, I, I think. I don't know if this even fits into pet peeves, but it jumped to my mind when we were doing this. It's more of like a mistake I think leaders make is like we all try to learn from people. Like we all should have mentors. We all watch people that we say, man, I'd like to be a little more like them or, I, you know, I'd sure. like to learn from them. But sometimes if you're not careful, you end up copying things that, that, that really don't apply to you. Like I'll give you an example. College. I see a lot of high school coaches, like basketball, for instance, because that's just what I'm around the most. They copy college coaches, like yeah. you know. And, and and if you think about high school and college, it's an apples to oranges type of deal. I mean, at the college level, a guy puts his system in, whatever system he likes, and then recruits players to fit that system. Well, it's the exact opposite in high school. You have players that you don't get to choose. They're just sort of at your school, or at least you're not supposed to choose them. They're at your school. And then you put together a philosophy or an approach that fits them. You see what I'm saying? So one of them is completely opposite of the other. Yeah, and yet, completely. Yeah. yeah, and you'll see people – like, think about this. You'll remember back when uh, Kentucky was really good with Rick Pitino and they were winning national championships. What did every high school coach try to do? Press and shoot threes. Don't, don't press, right? yeah. When Syracuse won the national championship back in the early 2000s, everyone don't stretch playing out the zone. two, two yeah. three zone. A couple of years ago – Virginia wins that everyone's playing pack line defense now because that's the thing to do. You know, it's like sometimes – and not not to say those approaches aren't really good at times. All those things can work if you have the right personnel. But just to say, I'm going to do them because, by golly, Tom Izzo, work for Tom Izzo, work for me. Well, no. <laughs> He's got different players than you have, obviously, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. and and I think sometimes we do that, though, just in leadership alone. We'll hear something on a podcast and think, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I should do that. Well, does it apply to – your situation i think sometimes and again that's where the art comes in versus the science now do you do you think sometimes too because again this all kinds of goes into the pet peeves and learning from leadership and so forth don't you think sometimes though people look at it as man if i 
if I don't have a more creative quick hitter, I can't I can't just pick down pick across now. Yeah. Nowadays, or, or people look at me like I'm a dinosaur. Well, if your team sets good screens and they curl and fade and hit people and share the ball and shoot the three and drive, I'd say it works just fine. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's, do you think sometimes people almost overcoach or overlead? They have too many meetings. They have too, like you said, that their handbook is 30 pages when it could be one. Right. You know, don't right. you think that all ties together in tonight's show in terms of? I think I think you called it more is better. Right. Was one of your right. pet peeves. I think I think that all falls or falls or perception line. again. What it looks like because you want to be able, you know, you want yeah, people to perceive people you as you're won't doing. think I'm doing a good job. Right. 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 I think that ha- I think that happens a lot of times. So. That was, I mean, those were pretty much the quote unquote serious ones. I know we're not like changing the world here necessarily when I say serious, but I mean, those were the ones that like applied to leadership. Now, um, I don't know if you got any more of those or we're going to, we're going to hit each other with some of the more off the wall ones here, but, uh, I'll let you go first. Well, the, the first one, the first one's been one that bothers me for a long time is the quarterback in football wearing a number higher than 19 there there is nothing that bothers <laughs> You've always me hated more. that man yeah look there's nothing that bothers me more than on a football friday night i go to a game i go and i get my you know we even we even started talking about you know svc treats on svc sports talk and stuff but we'd highlight oh, yeah. what we would eat and stuff i get and, and i look out there and you know there's like a number 20 or 30 whatever under center ticket to snap oh, yeah. in, in, in fact in, in all seriousness, I, I don't say a lot of names on here. I'll say the name on here because I, I'll give him a shout out. Lane Ruby was a quarterback at Southeastern High School here at our league. Oh, like, th- this kid was as dynamic and was, was was a treat to watch. I mean, oh, a treat. Well, he won, yeah, except when you're rooting for the other team. Yeah, yeah but but, but in my line of work, I would just start going to his game just to watch him play. He was that special, and there'd be time where you know they'd be up twenty five or whatever. It'd be cold, and and I would stay for one more possession just to see what he might do. You know, right, but but right. the one thing that would drive me nuts, he was number twenty five. Well, if you're going to if you're going to if you're going to go over nineteen, then yeah. twenty five is a good if, number. If, but I, you know, I mean, I, but yeah, I mean, I get what you're and, saying. And I always said, if he was that good, imagine what would have happened if he was like number twelve or number one. You know what I mean? Like, it reminds me back in the remember Doug Flutie won a Heisman wearing twenty two. Oh, every time I see the who, who film, that, the number drives me nuts. Who was that Michigan quarterback that wore like for a game wore ninety nine or something one time? Remember that yes. out of a tradition? There was a tradition. I mean, who yeah. cares about some, Michigan some, tradition? Some, Gee, tra- tra- some traditions need to be left alone. I mean, you, know, <laughs> you know, but but it is. I just and I understand sometimes in high school it's an emergency situation. But if you have an injury and you have to put the linebacker at quarterback or whatever, next Friday night get him a new uniform number. You know, what I mean? yeah. like it's one of those where that that would really really bothers me. I I I, I have trouble with that. Now I have a few more. I'll go back and forth. You you have one you want to throw? Yeah, and obviously the none of these are going to be the same because we didn't discuss these and we're just shooting them off. But, uh, and, and I got to give my friend credit for this one, but I agree with him too. The on pace too. That's always been like, you know, a guy a guy hits like two home runs in the first week of the season. He's on pace to hit 96 home runs, this year, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think jokingly today in the PGA tournament, I think it was uh, Scott Van Pelt, I guess I heard, said a guy eagled the first hole, and he's like, hey, he's on pace to be 3,600 today, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, but, but the on pace to people – now I, I, sometimes people use it as a joke, but there's sometimes people are serious about it, you yeah. know, like um, – so, so that's always been one. Uh, I, I like it. I like it. Now, this is this is one that some people that have coached with me in the past, and I'm not talking at a little league game when you're just trying to encourage a kid or whatever. This is more of a something you hear at a baseball game that at a higher level of hitting and trying to teach swings, trying to teach the kids get their hands inside the baseball and so forth. You always get the you know you get the kid that can't stay back, can't keep his hands inside the ball. He'll sit there and foul the ball over top third base dugout and you always get someone in the stands you know straighten it out straighten it out you know what I mean? well, <laughs> for some well, reason the straighten it out is, yeah. is more than i can handle and it's one of those that where people who have coached with me in the past they know it bothers me and right in the middle of the game 
<laughs> sure enough, if a ball comes rocketing down the third baseline at me, right, and I'm out of the way, you'll you'll hear an assistant coach from the Paint Valley dugout all the time giving a straighten it out, straighten it out. Oh yeah. Oh, you got to do that. Like if you know, like my assistant coach, like there's certain things I know bother him. I mean, like he he can't stand the word bank board. Okay, <laughs> he says it's supposed to be backboard. So if we're running a drill, I think, I don't, I think backboard was like 1978. Oh, if we're running a drill. I'm not kidding you. I will work in bank board 10 times if I can. You know what I mean? Like, take it strong off the bank board. I did it to the point one time where one of my players turned to, turned to uh, Coach Kite, our assistants, like, why does he keep saying bank board? <laughs> like, I overdid it to the point where, where he just he – just, he, he caught me on it. But, uh, no, but, you know, like, it's almost like Captain Obvious, right, with the straighten it out. Like, yeah, we know we'd right. like to straighten out. The, the, the one that I just thought of was I had a football game. You'll hear this every Friday night. Just listen for it. Yeah. You got to hit somebody. <laughs> Come on, guys. You got to hit. Like, well, no kidding. You got to hit somebody. It's football, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, oh, here's one for me. And I, and I actually mentioned this back when we were talking at another show about flopping. Right. Like flopping mm. just kills me, man. I mean, like you'll see it at the NBA, like a guy will get brushed across the face, man. His head will snap back. He'll hold his eye. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, your boy LeBron, man, is a flop artist. But uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, like I, I got so mad the other night watching the Reds Cubs because guys leaning into pitches. Okay, on like 75 mile an hour curveballs, oh, I'll lean in and stick my elbow out of the plate like Anthony Rizzo likes to do, you know. And I feel like if I was a pitcher, then and he wants to get hit that bad, then how about 89 in the middle of the back, you know what I mean, and then make him earn it. Because this, this stuff about like leaning in, flopping, uh, you know, that's, that stuff's always killed me, man, in sports. I mean, it seems like every sport has its version of, of flopping, doesn't it? I mean, like, oh, like it, it every, does. every single one. Well, and what happens is you, you talk about, you know, we, we were joking about role models last week. You know, what happens is you'll see more and more high school kids and, and on down into the younger levels, you can tell they start to see some of it. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll start to see them kind of uh, try to draw a foul, as you said, or draw attention to something the same way. And that, that's that's really true. Here's another one for you. I think I, I think I talked about this one a little bit in in, in past maybe. Uh, in March Madness, pet peeve of mine is the two or more bracket guy. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you'll you'll get the person in, in the office pool that has like five brackets, and every single score that comes up on the TV on Thursday afternoon. Yeah, I had that in one of my brackets. Well, no kidding. You have five brackets. You know what I'm saying? Like I always say, yeah. give me two choices to pick a game, and I'll get every one of them right once. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know I mean, it's like I. It's just maybe that's my competitive juice, or it's my basketball. I literally can say I don't know. I don't know other than maybe changing my champion just for the sake of putting it in another pool, or you know, you know what, what if if I think Oklahoma State is is going to beat Vanderbilt. In this bracket, why in the world would I ever pick another bracket picking any different? You know what I mean? I think the same team's going to win. So I, I don't know. That's 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 yeah, probably it, a half problem. the time. Half the time, those people end up losing because, like you know, they end up just splitting it. You know, because they'll get. Oh, I had that on this bracket. Well, not on right. this bracket. No, on this bracket. By the time, you know, it's. But I understand what you're saying because I used to play. To me, it was frustrating to even try to do that because. Uh, like I used to play in two fantasy football leagues, and yeah, then what would happen is you know, my, my receiver yeah. would be playing against my defense one week, and I'd be like, "Oh man, what do I even root for here?" You know, so I I, I kind of got to the point where I just like doing doing one at a time. Um, I didn't have really anything else other than uh, there's time like slow play in golf. That's a pet peeve of mine for sure. Uh, now, when I say that, I don't like to – when I go out and play golf, I'm not running to my ball, okay? I think there's a comfortable pace. I play golf with a guy every now and then who plays at an uncomfortably fast pace. I joke with him all the time, like, dude, we got to slow down, man. I'm breathing hard. You're, you know, you're making me <laughs> nervous, okay? So, like, you can overdo it. But, but like, when you get behind that foursome – I was behind a foursome the other day where, like, they would literally drive the cart up 
and set by each other as one guy hit and then drive over here and set by like, like they had to congregate and shoot the breeze while one guy was hitting instead of going to your own ball. And it was, it was frustrating. But uh, so I guess, I guess that would be one of my pet peeves too. I, I have one more and this, this is a little bit more serious because I think, I think here we're probably somewhere a month, maybe two months away from having what I think is going to end up being one of our most popular shows. We've had a lot of people ask me, Matt, probably two, three different times. I bet I've had five, six different people ask me multiple times, when, when are you going to do your basketball state of the game that you've been advertising? Right. And, and this kind of maybe goes with this. So, again, I'm having a little fun here still, but this is more of a serious sports note in terms of stereotyping and in leadership how it ties together. I wanted to talk about the NBA a little bit. I know I'm probably in the minority here a little bit, but it bothers me when people are not open-minded to how good the NBA is. Right. You know, so a lot of people don't like the NBA game, and I get that, but they just stereotype everyone, well, the NBA, they don't play hard. Well, you know, the NBA, they don't play good basketball. And I sit there and I just scratch my head like, what, what are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like the other night there was a high-scoring game and people were joking on social media. And I realized not some of the best defenders weren't in the game. But I'm also sitting there thinking, there's like four of the top 20 players in the world in this game right now. Yes. And they're shooting the basketball about every 12 seconds. Yeah. You know what I mean, let Russell Westbrook come down the floor at you one on one, and you slide your feet and keep him in front. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's one of those things that with the talent level is unreal. I'll see someone do something in an NBA game. Like the other night, I've been I've been teaching jab step a lot in terms of of working individual workouts with kids all the way down to the fifth grade, all the way up to their senior. The other night, I watched Anthony Davis jab step and circle the ball and do some different things. And I sat there and thought to myself, he's seven foot. You know I mean, oh, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Man. And I'm sitting I mean, there, I'm rewinding ridiculous. it, and I'm getting my phone right here, and I'm putting it up there and record. Yeah. You know, it's it's one of those things that I just wish more. And I'm not even talking about the average fan. I'm talking about basketball purists. I just wish more people would give the NBA game a chance because I'll be quite honest, it's kind of refreshing to see like the ball go in. You know, what I mean, I I love defense more than anybody. People who played for me, coach with me. They know there's nothing I enjoy teaching more than man-to-man -man defense in the half court. But at the same time, an appreciation. And I know James Harden over dribbles. And I know all those different things. But that right. doesn't mean the whole league's not bad. And at the same time, James Harden might over dribble. But I just watched him score 49 the other night. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, it's one of those things that, again, I'm not saying he's my best. He's my favorite. I'm just saying I don't understand why. What do you think it is that does not allow people – that obviously love the game of basketball, not to just appreciate how good these guys are and how big they are and how skilled they are. Yeah, I think what happens sometimes with the NBA, if you're not like a basketball purist or just lover of the game, the season ends up being maybe a little bit long, right? And the regular season maybe – in terms of like its importance, you know, half the teams make the playoffs or whatever. So it's like half of them don't know. play, load management, all that stuff. Right. Yeah. So you get some of that. Now, what's interesting to me, and like I'll be honest with you, I'm one of those people that don't watch a ton of NBA, but normally it's because like during the season, I'm busy. So during basketball, I'm, I'm busier. I don't get a chance to watch as much college or NBA as I'd like to. And the other thing about it is like, I watch – sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I love basketball, but, like, I need a break from it sometimes. You know, I watch I watch a ton of film, right. like, like, like getting ready for an opponent. I probably average five films per opponent that we play. So, if you think about it, I'm sitting there breaking down five high school games just to get ready for my own. Sure. Sometimes I don't want to go home and watch basketball, you know. So, this whole thing right now has been unique for me because I've been watching a little more NBA than I typically do. And the one thing about it, I made this comment to a friend of mine the other night as we sat there and watched the game. I said, you know, the NBA gets a lot right, man. I mean, the way they've handled this bubble thing has been pretty successful. And the way they've – I mean, they've doctored up that gym to look pretty cool. And they've got the virtual fans. They're doing a lot of cool stuff. And, and the thing about it is, too, the officiating. And I know we're going to talk in our state of the game about one of the problems in high school is the physicality of it. The, the, the officiating at the professional level is phenomenal. I mean, phenomenal. I mean, these guys, think about this. You take the best players on earth and you call the game in a way where that you allow a freedom of movement. You know, you're not allowing people to right. – this isn't like Bill Lambeer versus Bird where they're closed line and people coming through the lane anymore. You know what I mean? There is a, there is a beauty to the game now 
that didn't exist when you and I were growing up. Uh, mm -hmm. I just, just didn't. I, I don't know. I oftentimes say to myself, how would like a guy like Steph Curry have done, you know, there's, there would have obviously he'd have been a good player still, but how would the physicality of that game affected him, and how would the freedom of movement affected Mike Michael Jordan? <laughs> you know, in today's game, I think people would have adjusted, and they would have both been great players. But don't you agree? Like, they've 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 created a game that's that. I grant you, if you really enjoy a defensive battle of 81 to 79, it's probably not for you. But if you like watching the best players in the world be allowed to move and play, mm. pretty entertaining. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, my, that that's all I had too. I didn't want to cut you off. I'll I'll get us started here on on final thoughts this this week, and I'll give you the last word. I I think when I summarize this, I I knew this was going to be a fun show, but as I got into it more, I I, I was really interested about how much leadership I was learning, and I was reviewing because I think I think what I would say to people that I've learned from preparation and then doing this show now is. Pet peeves are a thing that are fun. They're, they're things that sometimes are just a personal thing that you have to look in the mirror and be aware of and, and know it about yourself and, and, and try not to get frustrated with certain things. But in all seriousness, I think you have to understand the, how you might influence other people. Then you have to understand things that bother them and, and things that might bother your team, things that might influence the, 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 the cohesion and, and, the, and the way things come together. We, we were in a staff meeting the other day and, you know, there, there's so much on our leaders plates right now. You try to be the team player, different things. Every now and then at a staff meeting, I'll notice kind of the guy that'll throw a little, you know, <laughs> comment in there or whatever, and kind of lighten the mood or whatever. And, and I almost felt like, you know, now's not the time or whatever. But there was even a couple people that, again, very professional in these meetings right now at the times we're going through. But there was even a couple people the other day that they had commented, like, <laughs> I thought for sure Shade had a comment there for a second. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean, yeah. there's someone's waiting for me to say it. But, but you understand what I'm saying it's one of those things where I think you have to be aware of who you are be aware of other people be aware of of what makes people click and and it's okay to have some fun it's okay to you know to to, to spruce it up a little bit but to kind of have that vision in terms of where you want to go and and I just think pet peeves and, and 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 that awareness is the word I keep coming back to is really a valuable thing that I've taken from the show. Uh, love to hear your comments on the word awareness and then maybe some final thoughts here to close us out this week. No, I think that's really well said. In all honesty, Shane, I, I was going to say very close to the same thing. I mean, I think the one thing you could take from this show is, you know, we had some fun with it, but I guess you can take it. It's important as a leader to figure out what makes your people tick and sort of what, what bothers them. So I don't want to go on and on and on because one of my pet peeves is that staff meeting you're talking about when the principal says, well, if we don't have anything else, we'll get out of here. And you grab, you start to stand up and it's like, well, Mr. Johnson, one more thing here. You know what I, mean? so <laughs> I, I don't want to be that guy. So no, you hit it on the head. It was a fun show and uh, looking forward to, to getting together again next week. Real quick, some contact information. If you want to give us an email, admin1 at svcsportzone.com. Again, that's admin1, svcsportzone.com. We're out there on, on all the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, this YouTube channel. If, you, if you're out there listening on your podcast app, iHeart, you know, iTunes, um, all, all the way across Sports Spotify, check us out on, on YouTube. That's SVC Sports Zone Shane. Uh, you'll see a lot of different things we're doing to cover our league, and that's an extension of our website. We call that SBC Sports Talk Plus, where we give a little plus coverage. Uh, but then, obviously, Matt and I will continue here with Expanding the Zone. Still have some really cool topics coming up, and uh, uh, some, some of our big shows that are still out in the distance a little bit. State of the Game football probably sooner rather than later, Matt, than State of the Game basketball later on, um, and, and some, some different things that um, – continue to come up as we hopefully get back to a little bit of reality. So on that note, appreciate it. Show 18 was a good one. Um, look forward to coming back to you next week on Expanding the Zone for Show 19. And, and, and until then, uh, just keep following uh, what we're doing. Comment, let us know uh, ideas for the show, and uh, we'll, we'll be back on Expanding the Zone next week. Thanks, everyone.